Okay. So, in today's class, we will talk about some basic elements of modeling and this is not something which is very new. You might have learned some of these concepts in your basic course on networks and, and circuits, something coming from mechanics or even as early as your high school physics. And we will see how all these uh, basic uh, elements which we will define can be used to model physical systems and we will also find out if there is any analogy between different kinds of sub subsystems. Okay. So, we start by classifying things into several types. Uh, it could either be a electrical system, a mechanical, electronic, hydraulic, thermal and several other systems. And each of these models as we will see or each of these systems can be modeled in terms of certain very basic elements. Right? And then we will see if there is any analogy between you know cross, cross domain between electrical and mechanical systems. And uh, through this lecture we will concentrate mainly on electrical and mechanical systems. Okay. So, in electrical systems based on the type of source we could classify systems either as being voltage controlled or current controlled source systems. Okay. So, in if I talk of a voltage controlled uh, system or a circuit, my basic system variables are the voltage and the charge. We will see why this is true, why it is the voltage and the charge, why not voltage and directly the current or why not something else. And of course, the ba three basic elements which we all know from circuits are a resistor, inductor and a capacitor. And throughout this, this class we will restrict ourselves to linear elements. Similarly, for a current sourced circuit or a system, my basic building blocks or the basic system variable are the system current and the corresponding flux. I also show you why this is true. Of course, the basic uh, elements then remain the same, the resistor, inductor and capacitor. Okay, so, how are these things defined? Well, we all know what, what a resistor is, it is an element which resists the flow of current in a system and we all know this Ohm's law V equal to I R models a simple uh, linear resistor. If I go to an inductor, I know that the voltage across an inductor is given by d phi by dt or in the case when the flux uh, is uh, linearly related to the current, we will have V equal to L di by dt. So, if I just write down some basic laws which we learn in electromagnetics, so phi is proportional to the amount of current and in the linear case phi equal to L times i where L is the inductance and then you have this linear relation between or this relation V equal to L di by dt describing a linear inductor. Similarly, for the capacitance I know that the charge similarly for the capacitance we know that the charge is proportional to the amount of voltage and in case of linear elements Q would be uh, C times V and I have a relation that the current which is nothing but the rate of charge is simply C dV by dt. Okay. So, what we will concentrate now is, is on these two things highlighted in the blue. How do we apply relevant physical laws and get some final form of the mathematical model? Okay. So, again coming from basic circuits, we all know what are the, uh, the nodal and the loop analysis and these are essentially coming from the part 6. right? So, whenever we do nodal and the loop analysis, we apply in, in, in the context of circuit either the Kirchhoff's voltage loss or the current loss and so on. So, once we identify basic elements, we interconnect them in a certain way which defines the circuit and then we write down the relevant equations. Okay. So, the nodal analysis as we know is based on the current loss and the loop or the mesh analysis, we write down the voltage loss. And this is again not, not very alien to us that the Kirchhoff current law says that at any node the directed sum of currents flowing, in, flowing out of that node is equal to 0. Similarly, the sum of voltages across closed loop is always 0 that is what the Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us. Right? So, if I just very simply look at this little uh, circuit kind of thing here. I would know that I 1 plus I 2 plus I 3 is 0 and if I just look at this as a loop, I can say that V 1 plus V 2 equal to 0. So, just look at the sign sets here I go from a plus to a minus plus V 2 is equal to 0 or in other words V 1 is just minus V 2. 
Okay, so let's start with with a simple example. Again, we start with very very uh, basic examples which we already know, and then try to build upon those things. So I have a, a current source, a resistor, inductor, capacitor, all linear elements, and if I apply the Kirchhoff's current law at node one, well, the circuit is a single node, that the input current, which is I, is equal to the current which goes through the resistor. Through the inductor and through the capacitor. Okay, so what is I through the resistor given V? That is simply I can write it as V over R. Across the inductor, it will just be one over L integral V dt. It just this all these equations again come from the basic laws which we had written earlier, right? V equal to L di by dt. I can rewrite this as uh, that the current is equal to 1 over l integral v dt so we had earlier that v is l di by dt or di by dt is v over l and i simply becomes 1 over l v dt so just rewriting things which we already know and finally the current across or current through the capacitor is cdv by dt Okay, what in what else do I know? I always know, I already know that V is simply d phi by dt, which means the current now can be written as C d square phi by dt square, this term, and across the induct uh, across the resistor I have V over R. What is V? V is d phi by dt, so I have 1 over R d phi by dt, and across the inductor that will simply be phi over L, right? And therefore, in the earlier side when I when I said Okay, let us just revisit that slide for, for a while. That the basic system elements are the current and the flux, this is what I mean. So, I have current here and the flux, okay. And of course, these are the basic uh, elements which, which build my circuit the capacitor, inductor, sorry, the inductor here and the resistance here, right, okay. Now, if I do a loop or a mesh analysis, it is also called something like a series RLC circuit with a voltage source. Again, all elements are linear. I have a voltage source V. Then, if I just apply my voltage laws, that the total voltage V would be the voltage across the resistor plus the voltage across the inductor plus the voltage across the capacitor with the current flowing in this direction. Okay. Again, I know these things again that V, the voltage across the resistor given I is simply I times R and V across an inductor, I already know from my previous slide that V is L di by dt and voltage across the capacitor can be written in terms of this 1 over C integral I dt in the similar way as we had written the current expression for an inductor. Okay. So, where does this current come from? Well, current is simply the rate of charge or I equal to dq by dt, which means that V can be written as L d 2 I by dt square. Just put this guy over here, I is dq by dt, so we'll, you will have a d2q by dt square, r times i, so again i is dq by dt, so I have r times dq by dt plus q over c. Again here the basic things are the voltage and the charge, okay, we will quickly go back and check if it is true or not. So, when I said that for the voltage sourced system or a circuit, the basic system variables that define my dynamics or the equations are the voltage and the charge, right? And we were somewhere in this step. So we applied relevant physical laws and got some final mathematical model. We'll see again. Verify that we started with the basic physical model, writing down the basic conservation laws to arrive at this dynamics of the system. Similarly, over here, a voltage control circuit or a voltage source circuit. I start with my basic laws and I arrive at this differential equation, which is the mathematical model of the system. Okay. Now, I go to mechanical systems. This is something which we learn much earlier than we do electrical circuits, right, when we do things in high school physics. So, I classify motions either translational motion or a linear motion as I call or a rotational system or something which has an angular motion about a fixed axis. Okay. So, what are the basic uh, things here? If I talk of translational motion, my basic system variables would be a force which causes a certain displacement. In the rotational motion or the angular motion, I have a torque which produces some kind of an angular displacement. 
And what are the basic building elements? I will have a mass which is essentially like a kinetic energy element, I have a spring which is essentially like a potential energy element and damper which is which represents the losses or friction in the system or it could also be like a as we will see we can also have an external damper to the system. Rotational motion I would have the moment of inertia, I will have the torsional spring and again the damp corresponding damping or the or the resistance element in rotational motion. Okay. So, what is mass? So, mass is a property of an element which stores kinetic energy right? and what does this mass do? So, when a force is acting on a body of mass m, it causes a certain displacement x and what does Newton's second law tell me? That the force is just the rate of change of momentum. Right. That is a, that's a statement of the second law, F is dp by dt and if I use the relation between momentum and velocity, so momentum is related to velocity as p is mass times the velocity where velocity if I could write in terms of displacement I will have dx over dt and then I will have this final relation that F equal to mx double dot or, or usually called as also referred to as forces m times a or mass times the acceleration. Similarly, in case of the rotational motion, I have the moment of inertia, the property of an element that stores kinetic energy in the rotational motion in such a way that when a torque is acting on a body of inertia j causing a displacement theta, then torque is j times theta double dot with the same analogy over here. And this is a direct direct one to one relationship between f equal to m x double dot and t equal to j times theta double dot. Okay. So, the second element is the damper, well what is this guy? The damper is an element which is essentially uh, which generates a force acting opposite to the direction of motion, right? it essentially blocks your motion or resists the motion. What are the examples? A natural friction which happens when we walk or when we drive a car or dashpot. So, these are the two examples and how are they modeled? So, if I have a force again causing a certain displacement x, the, the damper is modeled as f is b which is a constant which is like the damping coefficient dx by dt, a relationship linear relationship between force and velocity. Similarly, in the rotational motion I have the rotational damper or the friction as a linear relationship between the torque and angular velocity which is theta dot written as t equal to t d times uh, theta dot. Okay. The linear spring, as said earlier, linear spring is an element that stores potential energy in a way that when a spring when you have, have a force causing a certain displacement then the, for, the spring as we know will have a restoring force which will act on the opposite direction. So, if this is my force here F and so this is the thing where the spring and then the force of the spring would be somewhere here, I will call it F S right in such a way that F, so if I write down the conservation of the force here, the sum of all the forces is 0, I will have F plus F S equal to 0. And what we learn in school is we model this F s as minus k times x right? and then I put this here to uh, I substitute F x F s equal to 0 resulting then in this equation. Right? Okay. Similar thing happens in the rotational domain also right? that uh, the torsional spring is a property of an element it shows potential energy in the rotational motion. In similarly, when I have a torque that causes angular displacement theta, then the torque and theta are related linearly as t equal to k times theta. Okay. Now, how do we do equivalent nodal analysis for mechanical systems? In the electrical systems, we had direct loss, right? You have a circuit interconnected, then you write the relevant, identify the loops or identify the nodes, write down the voltage loss, write down the current loss, and you have sort of beautiful equations which describe for you the entire dynamics of the system. Okay, let us see the, the analogous of, of those kind of equations or those kind of conservation laws in mechanical domain. Okay. So, we should first have our system structure that would suit the nodal analysis 
and ok let us see with the help of an example right. So, I have a system composed of a spring, uh, I have a mass element, I have another spring and I have a damper or a dashboard and this is my reference node and with some external or with some force over here. The step 1 would be to identify the number of nodes and these are identified usually by the number of displacements right. So, I will have one corresponding to this guy here and the other corresponding to this guy here. So, these are my two nodes right node 1 and node 2 which will give me those two uh, displacements ok. So, once I identify these two displacements or these two nodes I just also fix identify these two nodes x1, x2 I mark them here and then I put have a reference node. Step 3 right we just go back to how these guys were connected that node between node 1 and node 2 and then with the ref between the reference I had the mechanical the mass between node 2 and the reference. Uh, k 2 between node 2 and the reference, B between the node 2 and the reference, between node 1 and node 2 I had the spring k and the force was kind of acting on the node 1 ok. So, we just draw some kind of a of a circuit diagram kind of uh, thing over that. So, I have a force x 1, x 2 are my two nodes. So, all these are the same this is also x 2, this is also x 2, this is my reference node so is this one this guy is also a reference node. So, I have the force I have a spring k 1 the mass element, second spring and the damping element right ok. So, once I do these connections as stated or as in the in the previous picture I have my some something like a circuit diagram right and the force F acts on this node 1 ok. Then I apply the Newton's laws at node 1 that I have a force and I have a spring. So, F would be k times the displacement and since I am dealing with two displacements x 1 and x 2 I will simply have f is k 1 x 1 minus x 2. Similarly, at the second node I say the sum of all the forces is 0 there is no external force coming from here therefore, I will have the force corresponding to the inertia element as m x double dot the force corresponding to k 2 with displacement x 2 would be k 2 times x 2 here would be b 2 x 2 dot and k 1 uh, the displacement or the, or the force corresponding to the spring k 1 would be k x 2 k 1 x 2 minus x 1 and I have these two balance laws for the for node 1 and node 2 which will give me the overall mathematical model of the system right ok. So, in summary what are the how do we identify the steps of a nodal analysis how do we come about uh, getting our models. The first is identify the number of nodes which is equal to the number of displacements select the reference nodes and then connect all the basic elements which are the mass elements or the spring elements and so on according to their positions. Similarly, do the for the spring and the damper if there is an external source which generates uh, or which, which produces a force or a torque also add that to your system and then finally, apply the Newton's loss of motion to arrive at your desired equations ok. Now, if you see go back and you see that there are these kind of equations look similar to what we had even for electrical systems and we then see well is there any analogy because both systems are written a set of conservation laws right. If I look at the electrical systems I have the voltage conservation or the summation of currents equal to 0 in the Kirchhoff's current laws here I also have some kind of conservation laws that summation of all forces is equal to 0. And based on these conservation laws, we will just try to investigate is there a good analogy between these two these two systems mechanical systems and electrical systems ok. So, let us investigate that one. So, that we could typically arrive at two kinds of analogies one would be where you can say that the force or the input torque is equivalent to the voltage where we have the which we call uh, the force voltage analogy or the F V analogy or we could also have situations where the force is analogous to current or what we call as the F i analogy ok. How to establish this ok let us start with the circuit right. So, again based on the previous steps which, which were listed I can easily write down that the force that this system which is exerted on this mass spring damper is m x double dot plus b x dot plus k x which is a mass a dissipative element and a spring with a constant k. Similarly, for rotational motion I can I can write down the equivalent of it ok. So, let us see I have the equations for this guy 
and see what does the how do the equations on the right hand side look like. Based on KVL, we, we derived earlier also that L q double dot plus R q dot plus q by c is the voltage that is applied. Okay. Now, this look very similar. right? So, I have a force as the input, here I have the voltage as the input, force produced a certain displacement, here voltage re resulted in some charge and q dot was the current and so on. Okay. So, therefore, I could say that force here is equivalent to the voltage, mass would in this case correspond to an inductive element, B the dashboard or the damper would correspond to a resistance, K the spring would correspond to a capacitor and the basic uh, system variable the displacement now corresponds to the charge. Okay. Let us go to the force current analogy. So, instead of having a voltage sourced circuit, now I have a current source circuit you know, which has elements in parallel I call, I, which I call as a parallel RLC circuit. This thing remains the same F is m x double dot plus b x dot plus k x and if I write down the equations for the, for the circuit on the right hand side, what I see that based on KVL I get I is C phi double dot phi is a flux plus phi dot over R plus phi over L, the sum of all the three currents through the resistance, the inductance and the capacitor. Okay. There is some, some analogy. Now, force could be analogously seen as the current, the mass could correspond to the capacitor, B would be the conductance or the inverse of the resistance, the spring then would correspond to the inductance like with the relation K goes to 1 over L and finally, the basic system variable, the displacement here now corresponds to the flux here and that is the reason we call it like the force to the current analogy. So, in my previous slide, the mass element corresponded to an inductor, now it just corresponds to a capacitor and so on. Okay. To, to summarize, what we have done so far is to find or to establish an analog between the mechanical systems and the electrical system, the force to voltage analogy or the force to current analogy. Similar analogy would be even for the rotational domain where I start from torque to the voltage or torque to the current and this table summarizes the analogy between various elements between the mass and the inductor or the mass and the capacitor or the basic system variable which is the displacement x here or the displacement theta to the charge or the flux. Okay. So, other kind of basic elements which we learn are systems which just transform energy from one system to other. In the electrical domain, we all know the transformer which transmits electrical energy from one circuit to the other through some electromagnetic induction properties. Analogously, in the mechanical domain, we have gears right, which is like again, it just trans transforms mechanical energy from one mechanical system to other via gears. Here, well, I can say I have, uh, I can measure that uh, the transformer as either a step down, step step up, or a step down transformer, which would change the voltage level. Here, it could change the speed and the direction of motion, and they just look like this, right? So, if I have a transformer with turns ratio n1 to n2, v1 by v2 is n1 by n2. And the current would be the reverse of it, it will be I2 by I1, right? It will be a step up or step down based on if N1 is greater than N2 or N2 is greater than N1. Similarly, in the mechanical domain, I have the torques on the both sides related by this relation. The torque torque T1 is related to T2 via the radius or inversely related to the angular velocity. So, these are again equivalent elements in the electrical domain to the transformer to and to equivalently a gear in the mechanical domain. Okay, so, what have we learned so far? We have classified physical systems and specifically concentrated on mechanical and electrical systems and their basic elements. We saw how by using basic conservation laws where the nodal or the loop analysis helps us get the dynamics of the system. We also established a beautiful analogy between electrical and mechanical systems and towards the end also learned about uh, energy transformation devices like just the transformers and the gears. So, what we will do next is to also learn 
some more physical examples right so starting from cruise control of a car we also look at some more details of the transformer of why what we saw in the previous slide is not really fit for analysis the simple pendulum and something which is which might be a little new called the predator prey models which i will explain you while we reach there